Years ago, I was living in Dublin, and I was on the number 16 bus coming from Dublin city centre, going to the north side, and I was late for a meeting. And I hate being late. Even though I'm regularly late, I do hate being late. <laughs> and I was getting along. These are the days before mobile phones, so I couldn't text to my boss to say I wasn't going to be there in time. And uh, as I was coming close to the stop where I was to get off, the woman who was sitting next to me, a woman I'd say who was in her mid to late 80s, turns to me and she goes, excuse me, son, would you help me with me shopping? And I thought, oh, you can't say no. There she is, she's tiny, she's frail, it's a winter's day, and she's asked for help with her shopping. So I thought, whatever, I'm late, I'll be later. So I stayed on the bus for a little bit longer, and we got off the, um, we got off the bus, and she pointed to where her shopping was for me to pick it up. And I'd say the shopping was no heavier than this waistcoat. So I carried this bag of shopping and we got out of the bus and she linked her arm in with mine and trotted along, proud as anything could be. And I thought, I'm smelling something here, something's happening. And as we're walking along to her house, somebody who looked like they were her neighbor walked past us. And the neighbor looked at her, looked at me, looked at her again and said, how are you, Mary? <laughs> and there was, I suppose, an ocean's level of implication in that <laughs> short little phrase. And then Mary looks back and says, some girls never lose their touch. <laughs> and I turned to Mary and I said, I think I've been had. And she said, you certainly have, son. Will you come in for a cup? <laughs> it is. One of the regrets of my life that I said, no, I'm late for a meeting. It was a boring meeting, somebody else didn't turn up. And I missed the opportunity to meet somebody extraordinary. It, well, meet them even more, she'd already accosted me. Another story. A few years ago, quite a few years ago, I was working in a religious environment. I was gay and not feeling so comfortable. I knew that were I to be more open about my life, I would probably have to leave my work and things weren't easy. I loved theology and I loved my work, but I also couldn't deny where things were for me. And I found myself in these unbelievably torn and split situation. And I was going for a walk uh, on Ho in Hollywood Strand with Father Jerry Reynolds from uh, Clownard Monastery. And Father Jerry, we're walking along, and he turns to me and he goes, Parik, I have a question for you. I said, work away. You know, nothing was ever rushed with Father Jerry. He died last year. Uh, he didn't even die, he rushed when he was dying. <laughs> but he goes, I have a question for you. And I, I said, work away. And he goes, do you have anybody in your life with whom there is a shared geography of the heart, uh, an imagination of the life, a venturing forth into the warmth of goodness and kindness and everything that can be good about humanity. I said, uh, are you asking me, do I have a partner? And he goes, well, I suppose I am, in a homosexual fashion. <laughs> and I said, um, well, I don't, I didn't at the time. And I said, but you're making it sound bloody good. <laughs> and he goes, well, that wasn't my intention, but I'm glad to have asked it. Stories and questions and lives lived well with imagination can open up the spaciousness about what it means to be human. Arundhati Roy, the Indian writer, said the following, writers believe they tell stories. Stories tell us. Stories cull people from the world. We are wrapped into this great thing called story. It is rumored that Anai Nin, the 20th century writer said, we do not tell stories as they are. We tell stories as we are. Stories are bigger than us, and if we can tell them well, we might just find ourselves being saved into something that doesn't exist yet, but can be imagined now and can lead us well. I grew up with Irish, and in Irish, to speak Irish, you have to know all the um, old phrases. And there's a phrase, er na and that translates as, it is in the shelter of each other that the people live. But the word ska in Irish can also translate as shadow, and so it is in the shadow of each other that the people live. I think you can say the same thing about stories. It is in the shelter of stories that people live, and it is in the shadow of stories that people live. 
I used to be a school chaplain, and one of the favourite students where he was a school chaplain was an 11-year-old called Ashling. She was fantastic. She was the star football player of the whole school. She was wonderful, full of life. And if she was bored, you were never in any doubt that she was bored. And one time, I was wittering away in front of the class, t talking about something. I don't even know what I was talking about. And she interrupted, as was her particular gift. And she said, Padraig, I have something to ask you. And I said, OK, work away, Ashling. And she said, right, I have a question. Uh, God made us all, right? And Ashling would have made a great lawyer. She knew how to set out a premise. And so I knew she's just setting out the premise. And so I said, grand, we've got that established. And then she said, and God loves us all, right? And I went, so, OK, we're building up the premise. And she goes, answer me this question. Why did God make Protestants? <laughs> And I said to her, you're going to have to tell me a little bit more about your question, Ashling. And then she told us the way that Belfast told her. Because she said, when I asked her why, what was behind her question, she goes, they hate us and they hate God. And I found myself thinking about it is in the shadow of stories that people live. She was born after the Good Friday Agreement. She was full of life, full of goodness, full of possibility, full of imagination. But even still, we inherit something about the stories we tell about ourselves or our place that can be limited. I said to her, I know a lot of Protestant people on football teams who would be delighted to have you on their football team. And she went, really? I went, yeah, because you're amazing. She went, oh. Now, that's a total lie. I know nothing about football. <laughs> I couldn't explain the offside rule to you if I tried. <laughs> but it is in the shelter of each other that the people live. And even fiction can give shelter. It can open up the possibility of the imagination. Ashling then said to me, I have another question for you. I went, all right, what's this? And she goes, what God made French people? <laughs> because France had just beaten Ireland in the football last the week before, and she was suspicious as to whether the goal that had won was a foul or not, and she believed that some other god must have made French people. <laughs> Belfast was telling her and telling us through the story that she asked, and this is part of the difficulty that we have to face. We have to find ways where our stories can be imaginative enough, broad enough, spacious enough, open to the imagination, open to the possibility of creating curiosity and relationships where there currently are none, open to the possibility of trust in the capacity to ask a good question, or when you're confused to say, I've never met somebody like you, tell me more about you. This is what is the possibility of the imagination in storytelling, firmly rooted in the reality of now, firmly open to the wide skies of possibility that exist in human encounter and human imagination and human relationships. One time I was working at Karimila, the organization that I lead now, and one time I was leading, years ago, I was leading a, um, a dialogue session over a year and the whole point was to bring people together who would have not ordinarily come together. There had been murder between their groups of people, and they were unsure, and they were beginning, understandably, to tell stories about the other. And often we tell stories about the other without the possibility of telling them to each other, and we speak about rather than with, and then suddenly, a year's gone by, a decade, two decades, and we don't know who began what, and the story is so enormous, we don't know how to undo it. And so these people came together in warmth and risk and nervousness and trust. We had tea and tables to lean on, and people began to tell their stories to each other. And one time, somebody told a story about themselves, and somebody said, that's not the story I've heard about you. And they said, what story did you hear about me? And they told them, and then they found out where they were wrong, and they found out why they were right. And another time, somebody said, I would hate to be a member of your group. And instead of that causing the group to fall apart, the person said, why is that? And the person who'd said they'd hate to be a member of that group said, why? And the person who was listening to it said, yeah, you make a fair point. It's difficult for me too. And suddenly the capacity to critique, the capacity to engage with each other was opened wide up. This is the quality of storytelling that we need, because Northern Ireland has moved far from sectarianism that we knew. We have a way to go, but we have moved very far from the sectarianism that we knew. 
but unfortunately we are living in a world that sometimes seems to be absolutely hell-bent and moving toward the sectarianism that we know too much about. Mm. And what we need is stories that open up the possibility of relationships where there currently are none, of trust where there can be more trust because currently there is none. In Irish, one of the ways to say trust is you are the place where I stand on the day when my feet are sore. And this is the kind of thing that we need in our wider society. The question as to whether truth needs to be part of a story is something that I'm interested in, because fiction is as good sometimes. One time, my mother, who lived with a long and painful experience of depression over decades, really, said to me casually over a cup of tea when I was only half tuned in, have I ever told you about the time when the Virgin Mary appeared to me? I said, I started to listen then, suddenly. And uh, I said, um, no, you haven't, actually. I think I'd have remembered that. And she said, I was lying on the bed in the middle of the day, sleeping during that difficult time. And she said, I woke up because there was a strange woman in the room. She was very ordinary, looking around 70. And she said, she looked like she was dressed out of Primark, but I knew it was the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and then she said, I felt the depression on the bed where she sat down. And then, in my mother's experience, the Virgin Mary looked at my mother and said to her, you've never liked me very much, have you? And my mother said, no. And she said, that's all right. And into the room came my little brother. My mother looked at my little brother and looked back, and nobody was there. Now, did that happen? Does it matter? The Zen Buddhists have an understanding that when the wrong question is asked, you can say, Mu, M-U, because sometimes to ask the wrong question is to inhibit the possibility of goodness that is present in the story. And so, did that really happen? Is it true? Mu. <laughs> did it mean a whole world? Yes. Did it open up the possibility of a life and a breathing that could breathe life where there had been little previous? Yes. These are the kinds of things we need for the tired spaces of our world. This is the way that we need to move forward in a world that is so interested in being comforted by the damp blanket of bad stories. We need stories of belonging that move us towards each other, not from each other. We need ways of being human that open up the possibility of being alive together. We need ways of navigating our differences that deepen our curiosity, that deepen our friendship, that deepen our capacity to disagree, that deepen the argument of being alive. This is what we need. This is what will save us. This is the work of peace. This is the work of imagination. A few years ago, as Belfast, I suppose 10 or 12 years ago, as Belfast was moving into the first few years of the Good Friday peace agreements, I um, was at a big, long, complicated, argumentative meeting in South Belfast. And uh, it had gone on an hour and a half too long already. And Sandra Rutherford was leading it. And it was, it was 11 o'clock. It was supposed to have finished by um, half past nine. And she was going, I'm going to bring this to a close. And Seamus was next to me. And Seamus puts his hand up. Seamus was in his early 70s. And Sandra knew Seamus very well. And Sandra said, Seamus, we're an hour and a half overdue. And so do you really have something to say? And he goes, I do, I do, I do. And uh, she said, is it actually important? because she knew him well, and there was about 120 people there, and you could feel the anxiety in the room, people wanting to go. And Seamus goes, it is important, absolutely. And she went, Seamus, I'm going to give you around 20 seconds. Sandra's a very gentle person, but not with Seamus, because she was going, seriously, Seamus, keep it short. And so the room settled down as far as we could. Seamus stands up and he goes, well, now that I have the floor, I'll start with the story. <laughs> and the room relaxed, a well-told story, can change the way we relate to time. It can change the way we relate to each other. It can take tired energy. It can take the capacity to leave and turn it into the capacity to stay. And what happened afterwards is that people stuck around. People stayed. Seamus had a big queue of people. I don't remember what the story was. What I do remember is that his story opened up the wide, expansive places of humanity that we can be part of. 
This is the work that Coramela does. It is the work that so many organizations and places of goodwill do. It is the work of the kitchen tables that are yours. This is the possibility of being human that we can have when we tell good stories widely with a great imagination. This leads us into the deepest possibility of our imagination and of being human. Thank you. <laughs>